Okay, welcome, Paul. My sound just seems to be, uh, your, your sound disappeared, but let's hope it works. Can everybody can hear me? Well, good, good morning or good afternoon, I guess it should be. Thanks for being here. And I can't tell you how, how pleased I am to be able to uh, speak with you today about the uh, centenary issue. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to thank Kim for continuing to promote these, these monthly Zoom meetings. Uh, they really do give members a, a wonderful opportunity to meet with others and learn about their collecting interests. And I would also like to thank a few members who have been very generous with their time and information and encouragement as I've tried to put this collection together. Uh, and, and that's namely Hugh Osborne, uh, Stephen Palmer, Stefan Heights, Ralph Riddlecare, John Baverstock and Bill Featherstone. They have all been helpful in one way or another. So let's, let's begin the program. Okay, the Falkland centenary stamps were, were issued to mark the 100th anniversary of the first permanent settlement in the Falkland Islands under British rule. And since time today is short, I'm going to make no attempt to review this history uh, leading to the settlement. It's wonderfully summarized in Ronnie Spafford's book on the series. And if you haven't uh, read it, try to do so. If you can find a copy, it's really a, a wonderful book. The set of 12 stamps is well known to philatelists the world over, and it's long been considered one of the most beautiful sets of stamps ever to be issued by any country. And of course, the five shilling penguin is a clear favorite. So today I'd like to explore the creation of the series and share with you some really interesting history over the last 80 years. <coughs> In early 1932, committees were formed to plan the centenary celebrations and Postmaster Maud Carey proposed that a set of stamps be issued to mark the event. A man by the name of George Roberts agreed to head this subcommittee surrounding the stamp proposal. Now, Roberts arrived in the Falklands in 1921 to supervise the construction of a fuel oil storage facility. And he would bring his family over a year later in 22, and they would remain in the Falklands for the next 17 years, overseeing sanitation, road construction, water facilities, etc. He was very active in day-to-day in -day activities in Stanley, and he would soon become chief of the fire brigade. He was a harbor master, a justice of the peace, and he was able to pursue his <clears throat> love of nature, music, and art, and photography. And he was instrumental in the construction of the 1914 Battle Memorial and the Centenary Memorial Arch built with uh, whalebone jaws on the green by the cathedral. Roberts immediately set to designing the 12 stamps. And it is a real testament to his, his sense of design and knowing what images would be of importance to residents that 11 of his designs were accepted by the Crown agents with only small adjustments and just a single one was rejected outright. The essays that we most often see are, are black and white stamp size images printed on photo paper with some such as these bearing hand coloring and, and their production method is also uh, detailed uh, in the uh, Spafford book. I believe that there are two groups of these essays currently on the market. The first is those created in, in 32 and 33 by Roberts, but there's a second group created uh, actually by parties unknown to me, but uh, probably around the early 1950s and this uh, second group is a uh, reprint should be considered just that. They are reprints and, and of minimal value. Now the, the, the two groups can be easily told apart. The originals are, are printed on a thicker paper with a distinctive rough edge pebbled surface. The black and white images you see are a much warmer shade 
and then the other reprints, the reprints are printed on much thinner photo stock. They have a smooth and shiny finish and the images all possess a much cooler tone. Spafford's book depicts a, a wonderful group of essays that he prepared, that Roberts prepared in 1933. And these were part of Spafford's collection sold by Spink in 2015. Surprisingly, we see here that Roberts suggested that some of the values be issued not as uh, bicolors, but as tricolors. Here's the three penny in blue and yellow and red. And here's the five shilling in yellow and black and red. I think that we would all agree that the Crown agents made the right decision in sticking to go with just the bicolored stamps. The only Roberts design rejected by the Crown agents depicts a river of stones. These uh, were geological formations unique to the Falklands. And the Crown agents, however, felt that this image would not work well when reduced to stamp size. So instead, they selected an image of a fin whale that was taken from the RRS, Royal Research Ship Discovery's badge, and they would incorporate it into uh, their design for a six penny stamp. And here, of course, is the finished stamp in the uh, Discovery badge. Here's a lovely Roberts prepared hand colored presentation sheet depicting the entire set, probably prepared fairly early in the design process as it still depicts the River of Stones image, but now is a six penny value. The sheet was probably trimmed a little bit at the top, but inter interestingly on the reverse, there still remains a, a manuscript notation reading colonial secretary. Uh, perhaps it was being prepared for him. We now turn to a <clears throat> very brief showing of some centenary proofs. And I say brief here because there really are very few uh, proofs available to collectors today. Most are, are held in either printer archives or in the Royal Collection. This is an engraver's progressive die proof of the half penny vignette, the Romney Marsh Ram. It's called a progressive die proof because it's pulled by the engraver as he works on the image. And thus it differs slightly from the finished engraving. We can see here that the animal's legs and hooves have yet to be finished. And the animal's face has been lightened in the final version. And this is a pretty scarce item with probably just about two pieces known. Here's a completed die proof of the one and a half P whale catcher vignette. It depicts the whale of Bransfield and it is the finished die proof used to uh, transfer the image to the plate. Also a fairly scarce item. It was common practice that the printer would supply specimen stamps to the GPO for distribution to UPU countries. And here we have the set perforated with the word specimen in an arc by Bradbury Wilkinson. And records indicate that there are 427 stamps of each value provided to the GPO. Here's a close up of the, uh, of the punch. I wanted to show you this set of specimens because it's the only set of pairs that I've ever seen in, 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 in the last 15 years. I don't uh, know if there are other sets available or if there are larger multiples, but if anyone knows about them, I'd certainly like to hear it. I bought these on eBay from a dealer in Argentina. Here's a unique set of specimens. In addition to the Bradbury Wilkinson punch, each bears a, a violet straight line specimen overprint. They are from the Bechuanaland Protectorate archives, who in the early 70s decided to send their specimen books back to the GPO. And the GPO in turn gave them to a Robson Lowe 
who broke the books up for an auction held in 1976. Uh, this set is, is, is from that sale. And here's another unique set of specimens. This time it's from the Spanish Morocco archives and they're identified with a, uh, an octagonal identifying mark stamped on the back of each stamp. It reads uh, official collection of Spanish Morocco. I am not aware of any other centenary specimen sets from UPU archives that are available to collectors, but, but others may exist. I'd like to briefly talk about some of these stamp varieties uh, that occur. There are not a lot of collectible varieties of the centenary stamps, but I think a few deserve uh, a special mention here. Probably the most a well-known printing variety is the thick serif stamp shown here is an example, and you can see that it appears in the upper left value tablet of the one penny stamp. It's found on uh, position three of the first printing. And here are the tops of two sheets, one from the first printing with the error and the uh, uh, another from the second printing. We now see the error has been corrected. Covers uh, bearing the thick serif variety are really quite scarce. I, I know of just three, including this one shown here going from South Georgia to, to Buenos Aires. Now, just, just when you think there's nothing new to discover with an issue that's been around for more than 80 years, you're surprised. In the Upland Goose winter issue of 2013, Malcolm, Barton, and Kim Stuckey announced, quote, an exciting centenary issue discovery. Turns out there is a consistent plate flaw on position 51 of the one and a half P value. And credit for uncovering this flaw goes to Nigel K. It's been dubbed the cloud flaw variety. And it turns out that position 51 is the upper left stamp of the bottom imprint block. So anyone who had any imprint blocks of that value started looking, myself included, and I was fortunate to find one. It, it turned out However, that not all uh, imprint blocks uh, show this flaw. So the question was, of course, did this variety occur on the first or the second printing? Well, I think this piece here helps to answer that question. Here is the variety tied to a small piece with a Fox Bay first day cancellation, January 2, 1933. So obviously, uh, the one and a half P is from the first printing in this example. Before moving on, I'd like to show you one more Cloudflow item. It's a pack boat posted at sea postmark applied at Plymouth in September of 33. The UPU had established special handling regulations for mail posted on the high seas and such mail might, might originate with passengers or crew or it might be picked up at a port of call that lacked postal facilities for onward transport to the next port that had postal facilities, in this case, Plymouth. Uh, there it was postmarked and placed into the mail stream for delivery. The last variety I'd like to talk to you about is the five shilling yellow orange color variety from the second printing. This printing is noticeably darker and has a more orange cast than the pure yellow of the first printing. The first printing block shown here is admittedly a very pale yellow version. Other, other first printings ex do exhibit a darker and more orange shade, but never as dark as the second printing. Looking at the quantities delivered and the number of stamps destroyed, the second printing turns out to be about five times scarcer than the first printing. And the yellow orange imprint block shown here on the right is the only one known to exist today. It was part of the uh, Falcon collection belonging to the infamous and reclusive collector John DuPont, who died in prison in 2010 while serving a 30 year sentence for murder. We know that DuPont liked rare items, and after his death, 
it was revealed that he was not only the owner of this rare block, but of the world's most valuable stamp, the one cent British Guiana sold by Sotheby's in 2014 for $9.5 million. So now let's move on to the announcements and the centenary celebration. The initial plan was to release the centenary stamps on the first day of the new year of 1933, and an official announcement had been printed describing in detail each of the stamps in the issue. There was just one small problem. January 1st fell on a Sunday, and so the post office was closed. The official first day would need to be moved to January 2nd. The announcement shown here, excuse me, was sent to the USA at the half P printed matter rate, and it bears a manuscript uh, correction to the issue date. It pairs beautifully with, with this announcement, also sent to the USA, but now at the single foreign rate of two and a half P. You can see that Maud Carey had added a personal note up at the top and signed it at the bottom, thus disqualifying it from being sent as a piece of printed matter. Now, both the HMS Durban and the Discovery 2 were in court at Stanley for the centenary celebration, and the sailors would take part in many of the activities. Here are two first day covers, each with a full set of stamps. The first here to Commander Walker aboard the Durban, postmarked at Stanley on January 2nd. And then this cover, postmarked also on January 2nd at South Georgia, going to W.A. Horton, who was the chief engineer aboard the Discovery 2. The opening day of the centenary celebration was scheduled for Sunday, February 12th, and festivities would be overseen by Governor James O'Grady. And the program was printed at uh, Stanley, and here was the official bronze medal that was uh, issued for the opening day. And one of my favorite pieces in this collection was a postcard that I, I was able to purchase on eBay many years back for just a few dollars. It, it bears a one penny centenary stamp going to Birmingham, but you see that the message side is, is dated 12 to 33, the opening day. And it reads in part, quote, the centenary here today in special stamps issued sheep, penguins, whales, beautiful, unquote. Well, I can't imagine having a more relevant piece than this simple postcard in the collection. And while we're here, I'd also like to show you another eBay purchase that means a lot to me. It's a simple autograph note from Governor O'Grady that says much about this man. Now, O'Grady was a, uh, he was a devout Catholic and he writes in this note, quote, O gracious father of life, as I grow old, vouchsafe to use still the student mind, unquote. That's probably something we should all aspire to. In poor health, O'Grady would leave the Falklands in July and return to England. He died on December 10th, 1934. We're now going to talk about one of the more interesting aspects of the centenary set, and that was Argentina's refusal to acknowledge the centenary stamps. This quote appeared in the Argentine newspaper La Pensa. I'll give you a second to read it. Moving on, um, this was a sign here that greeted my wife and I when we arrived in Ushuaia some years ago en route to the Falklands in South Georgia. As we all know, Argentina has long held that the area belongs to them, referring to them, of course, as the Malvinas. And to say that they were not happy with the centenary stamps would certainly be considered uh, uh, an understatement. In March of, of that year, Argentina's Director General of Posts and Telegraphs he advised the UPU in Switzerland that any incoming correspondence bearing centenary stamps would, 
would be considered as not stamped and corresponding charges would be applied to all such mail. Criticism of the stamps rapidly became a national story. The British ambassador to Argentina, Sir Ronald Mackley, suggested that if Falkland postal authorities could arrange for this particular issue not to be used on correspondence to Argentina, the matter would probably end. Well, Governor O'Grady took an immediate exception to the ambassador's suggestion and said that such an arrangement, quote, will not for a moment be entertained. So let's take a peek, let's take a look at the Argentine charges imposed on, on centenary franked covers. Uh, this cover here to Buenos Aires with five the centenary stamps neatly applied could certainly be considered to be by some an unapologetic franking. And so it's not surprising that the Argentines would have none of it. They imposed the following charges at Buenos Aires. They doubled the incoming 10 centavo domestic postage rate. They doubled the 20, cent, 20 centavo registration fee. And then they added a fine of 30 centavos for a total of, of 90 centavos. And then as was common practice, they a large uh, rectangular postage due marking was applied to the covers reverse, a cobrar meaning simply to collect. The next cover I'd like to show you is a tax cover to Rosario, Argentina, Frank now with seven different centenary stamps. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. First, the postage due marking is not only applied on the reverse, but also squarely on the uh, cover's front. And that's a very, very uncommon practice on these covers. I like to think that was maybe one, one way the postal clerk was able to declare his displeasure with the centenary stamps. But more importantly, however, this cover is from the very first batch of centenary franc letters to be received in Argentina was posted at Stanley on the 14th of February and more than likely left aboard the Lafonia on March 3rd, arriving at Montevideo in Uruguay, where it would be handed over to Buenos Aires on or about March 10th. The Argentine legislation deeming the centenary stamps valueless was still being debated. So the cover was held at Buenos Aires until the legislation was passed a few days later on March 15th. Subsequently, Buenos Aires receiving marks dated March 16th were applied in the cover forwarded to Rosario, where the postage due markings of 96 centavos was added. The amount is incorrect. It should have been just 90 centavos, but most likely a, a clerical error or simply a confusion regarding the new penalties. Taxed covers bearing centenary stamps from South Georgia to Argentina are really quite rare. And this example is surely one of the most unusual uh, to be seen. It was sent by Alfred George Nelson Jones, the postmaster at South Georgia. And the postmarks and various manuscript notations on the front only hint at this cover's incredible journey. So let's take a look at the back. There are more than two dozen postmarks, manuscript notes, and auxiliary markings on this cover. But again, since time is short today, we'll just look at a brief summary of the dated postmarks to get an idea of this cover's journey. We see that it's postmarked on December 30th, 1933 at South Georgia, and it arrived about two and a half weeks later on January 17th in Buenos Aires, was held there for a week before being forwarded to Pergamino, which is a town about 150 miles northwest of, of Buenos Aires. Pergamino immediately forwarded it to Arrecifes, about 30 miles away. It was held there for about three and a half weeks before sending back to Pergamino, where just two days later, it was sent to 
Olivos, a suburb of Buenos Aires. And here the trail goes a bit cold because we now find the cover almost seven months later back at Stanley on November 24th, 328 days after it, after it left uh, South Georgia. I think here there's really a lesson to be learned from this, this remarkable cover. Considering the fact that the issue was so disliked by Argentina, the cover truly represents the Argentine's post office's commitment and dedication to simply delivering the mail. They really did try. Whether or not it was ever returned to the sender, Nelson Jones is not known. Now we're going to look at perhaps the other really interesting part of the, the Falkland Centenary set, and that is it's their relation to the first airmail flights in the Falklands. Uh, the first flights, airmail flights, took place in 1934, <clears throat> and the story of these flights is well documented in articles in the Upland Goose, most notably one some years back by Wilf Vivas, and more recently one by Hugh Osborne. There are also uh, contemporary accounts in the Penguin Daily News Sheet. And while we do know some details about the flights, there remain questions that have yet to be answered. So right now, I would like to talk about what we know. We know that the Exeter arrived in the Falklands on the 18th of November, 1934, and that she would remain in Stanley until November 30th. This photograph shows the Exeter in Stanley on November 29th, dressed overall with flags to honor the royal wedding of Prince George and Princess Marina. It's really quite unusual to find a photograph that's so well documented as this one, with a handwritten text on the back confirming the location and date of the photo. And I was lucky to find this one on eBay some years back. We know that the Exeter carried two fairy uh, three FC planes. You can see one here clearly, and here's the second one on the other side. And these were capable of being launched by catapult. And here's a photograph showing one being catapulted from the ship. To return to the ship, they were simply hoisted uh, with a crane. Now, we know from accounts in the Penguin that on the 26th of November, the two seaplanes flew from Stanley to San Carlos Station, a distance of about 50 miles as the crow flies. However, that morning they flew a somewhat circular route passing over uh, uh, Fitzroy and Darwin. And this first flight is shown here in blue. Now in one of the planes sat Norman Keith Cameron of Port San Carlos, and he would earn the distinction that they are becoming the first civilian passenger by air in the Falklands. We know from the Penguin report shown here that he carried on this first flight a letter from Ernesto Rowe, the manager of the state Louis Williams, addressed to J.F. Bonner of San Carlos. For 85 years, collectors believe this cover was the only one carried on the flight. But then in 2019, a second similar cover was found in South Africa in the collection of one Hugh Thomas. Hugh Thomas was a press officer who served in the Falklands in the 1930s. The cover bears the one and a half piece centenary stamp tied by the violet straight line, first airmail 261134. This was a truly remarkable find, and it really begs the question of what role Hugh Thomas may have played in the early airmail flights. We also know from the article in the Penguin that the two planes returned from San Carlos to Stanley that later that same day, this time flying a more direct route over the North Camp region. And this is the second flight shown here in green. According to the Penguin, they carried an unknown number of covers in a covering envelope addressed to Maud Carey, presumably for posting in Stanley. 
Now, we, we really do not know the details of any of the covers carried on this second flight, save for one. It was a letter from Jack and George Bonner to the acting governor, M. Craigie Halkett. The complete text of that letter was reprinted in the November 29th issue of the Penguin, praising the potential impact of airmail flight. Unfortunately, the whereabouts of this cover and letter are not known today. Perhaps it was destroyed in the post office fire in the 40s, or maybe it's just filed away somewhere in government house waiting for someone like Stefan or others to come across it someday. We can only, only hope. We know that the Exeter left Stanley at six in the morning on November 30th, heading to Port Stevens on West Falkland for refueling before leaving for South America. She left behind two seaplanes with the men who could provide assistance to the research ship Panola, which was also in port at the time, was having problems with her wireless equipment. The planes would fly to Port Stevens later in the day to rejoin the Exeter. And this is the third flight, and that's shown here in red. We know that an unknown number of covers were carried on this third unscheduled flight to Port Stevens, where they presumably entered the maelstrom. maelstrom. Of the five uh, covers from this flight, all bear the two penny centenary stamp, and four of the five bear the violet airmail overprint. And all but one are addressed to West Falkland stations, including Port Howard, Charts, and Port Stevens. This cover from the third flight is addressed to Lewis Williams' sister-in-law, Grace Bossingham, and it's the only one with an East Falkland address. It was held with the other mail at Port Stevens until early January 1935, when it was brought back to Stanley by the mail ship Lafonia for forwarding to San Carlos. The Lafonia's arrival was confirmed in the January 5th issue of the Penguin, and the cover is clearly backstamped on that date in Stanley. Another recently discovered cover from this third flight was found in 2014. Oddly, the applied two penny stamp has no overprint, but upon careful examination, a bit of violet ink can be seen on the surface. It was addressed by Norman Keith Cameron to his nephew, John Gibson Cameron, in care of the Exeter at Port Stevens. We also know that there exist two pieces from the third flight. The first bears a single overprinted two penny stamp, but the second piece is a truly remarkable item. It bears four different centenary stamps, each with the violet airmail overprint. It's addressed by Ernesto Rowe in the handwriting of Ernesto Rowe to Commander Vaughan who was the paymaster aboard the Exeter. And three of the four values are unique with this overprint. So to sum up, that's basically what we know about these airmail covers and the flights surrounding them. What we don't know and may never know is who prepared uh, these violet overprints and when and where they were applied to the stamps. We know nothing conclusive about any covers carried on the second flight, save for the one from the Bonners to the acting governor. But most importantly, and in the broader sense, we still do not know who was the driving force behind the overall promotion and creation of these covers. The two names that seem to me to be more involved with these covers than anyone else are Ernesto Rowe and now, just recently, Hugh Thomas. Rowe addressed the two November 26th flight covers. He also addressed the cover from the third flight and the piece with the four centenary values to Commander Vaughan. And we know that Hugh Thomas, among other duties, served as editor for the Penguin and probably wrote the articles about the flights. As a press officer, he, probably more than anyone, knew that the publicity surrounding Keith Cameron's flight could work to the island's advantage and help to usher in a new era of airmail service. Hopefully at some point, 
we'll be able to learn more information about these flights. Now, the last piece I'm going to show you is a philatelic piece, but it's one that has an interesting story. The, it's a postcard, postal card. The message on the card's reverse reads, quote, this is from supposed most Southern PO in the British Empire to the most Northern, unquote. So a bit of background. For 34 years, starting in 1912, the SS Nascope, part of Canada's uh, Eastern Arctic Patrol made annual voyages throughout the Northern Territories, providing native populations with vital services. But in the early 30s, the Nascopi underwent refitting and its duties were taken over for a while by the SS Ungava. Each year, all mail destined for the Eastern Arctic was held at Ottawa until the third week of June when it was transferred to the Nascopi at Montreal. This card, postmarked on the 4th of November, 33 at South Georgia, shows that it departed on July 7th, 1934 from Montreal, and it would reach its northernmost uh, port at Craig Harbor on Ellesmere Island on September 16th, 1934. The odd use of the uh, uh, occupation of the German occupation of Belgian postcard is, is of absolutely no significance. The manuscript in Gava, however, clearly indicates that the sender in South Georgia was unaware that the Nascopi had returned to service for the 1934 voyage. And to give you an idea of the impact that the, these voyages had on the native population, here is the route of the Nascopi in 1934. She made 24 ports of coal during this voyage. The centenary set would be withdrawn from sale on December 30th, as the 31st, like January 1st, also fell on a Sunday. Here is a cover postmarked at Stanley on that last day. And a short time later, uh, George Roberts would help to oversee the destruction of the remaining stamps in the furnace of the Old Town Hall. The set of 12 centenary stamps rank today among the most beautiful and sought after sets ever produced. And it has been my distinct pleasure to share with you today some of the items from this uh, incredibly beautiful set and some of the history of this wonderful set of stamps. So thank you very much. I'm gonna unshare the screen and if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be, be happy to entertain them. <laughs>